Thanks for the nice introduction and particularly for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's been a long time since I've been here. And I, it's so long, well, I don't remember how long ago it was, but then that's not that unusual these days. Uh, but uh, it's, it's been really fun being here and talking to people and hearing some really exciting, great science. And, and I really enjoyed the day. And I, I thank you for sticking around to hear uh, some of the things that we're working on. Uh, the overall sort of scientific questions, the big picture questions that, that we're particularly interested in is have to do with essentially dated conformational changes. And in the case that I'm going to be talking today, uh, you know, that could be by voltage, it could be by mechanical stimulation, but I'm going to talk about uh, ligand binding and ligand induced conformational changes. And this fits on the topic of cooperativity and uh, along the lines of general allosteric regulation of different processes within a, a gated protein. And the model system that we've been working on also has important physiological significance. It's the SK small conductance calcium activated potassium channel. So there, there are two different types of calcium channels, the big ones and the small ones, and that's big BK and SK. There's also an IK, but it's really a fake SK. Uh, uh, and the SK channels are purely calcium dependent. They're involved in a lot of physiology, uh, vascular, uh, blood pressure regulation, uh, their after hyperpolarizations and a lot of neurons. Uh, Gene told me this morning about uh, things they do in the heart that I should have already known about. And uh, there are also bee stings uh, in along with other things, target these channels. The, the B venom protein apamine uh, uh, blocks uh, SK channels. The interesting thing to us about it is that the calcium sensitivity is uh, conferred by a constitutionally bound calmodulin molecule. And calmodulin is, is really interesting uh, because it's the one of the few primary calcium signaling proteins in cells. It has a structure with two pairs of binding sites. Uh, they're EFN structures. There are two paired sites, EF1 and EF2 at the end terminal, a long flexible linker, and then two more uh, tightly coupled binding sites for calcium at the C terminal. Uh, I'm going to call this a lot of times the in-lobe and the C-lobe, and they have uh, four different binding sites. There are over 300 different targets for calmodulin for calcium-regulated proteins, and this is just a, a depiction of uh, crystal structures. Well, I already ruined the pointer, too. There. Uh, if uh, in all sorts of different target proteins. And you can see that, that calmodulin is really flexible and it adapts to different uh, tertiary structures when it's bound to different target proteins. It's also one of the most con highly conserved proteins uh, in, in life. It's uh, you can see just the pictures here is that the redder and wider these residues are, uh, the more highly conserved they are. They're particularly conserved in the calcium coordinating and, and binding sites. This goes throughout the, uh, um, essentially the entire animal kingdom has only one sequence. There are a few differences here and there. To see any diversity of sequences, you have to go outside uh, of animals and into uh, they're particularly diverse in fungi. Uh, yeah, but they're also the uh, calmodulin in humans. There are three calmodulin genes, and they all code for exactly the same protein sequence. 
And so the differences are only regulatory and modulatory. And the, uh, the conservation is really high. And it's clear if you look at different classes of, of life that the, there's more homology or more sequence similarity between the, uh, any given site between uh, uh, different organisms than there is among the sites. And so the EF1, the EF2, the EF1 and EF2 have uh, in the calcium binding loop, which consists of six residues, there are five of them that are different. And by doing an evolutionary bioinformatic analysis, it's clear that there was selection uh, that, uh, that really froze in these sequence differences. And so there, each of the four um, amino acid, I mean, uh, binding pockets have, have quite different conserved properties. So what we have done is we've, so, yeah, John, John. No, no uh, well, ba bacteria has a lot of uh, similar things, but there are also a lot of ones that aren't, uh, that have some of the properties and some not. And so the, uh, the Similarity has been only sequence-based because there's no functional work on them. And th that's something that uh, we particularly, I think, if we ever get around to it, want to look at this diversity in the funguses uh, because it's radiated tremendously there, but that's the only place that it seems to have done that. So we've taken this essentially two-step process where calcium binds to calmodulin, calmodulin changes its conformation, and opens the channel. And uh, we've divided up into basically the two different steps with uh, uh, at least three different approaches. There's the biophysics of calcium binding to calmodulin. Then there's the interactions energetically between the calmodulin and the channel, which we've studied both in excised patches uh, on intact channels, but also in uh, cuvettes with the isolated uh, uh, calmodulin binding site peptide in solution. And so I'm going to spend a lot of time here talking mostly about the general property of, uh, of parameter estimation for different sorts of binding mechanism. And I'm going to talk a little bit at the end, depending on time, on some of this work that has some interesting implications in relationship to the recently published uh, SK channel sequence, I mean, uh, structure, and the mechanisms that have been inferred from the structure. So to start off with, and I'm, I'm going to go through this in a, in a fairly step-by-step uh, -step, uh, explanation. It's going to be familiar to a lot of you. Uh, but basically for ligand activation, what you see is that if you plot the activity, in this case it would be channel opening against the log of the uh, concentration of the ligand, you see a stereotyped uh, curve that is, is basically the input-output relationship that comes from binding and then any activation that happens after binding. And so this, these involve the number of different sites and their individual ligand binding affinities and the cooperative interactions uh, between the binding sites where binding at one position will affect their affinity at a neighboring position. And, uh, and then the coupling of the binding occupancy to the conformation, which is the gating part. And these curves will if you actually plot, plot binding by, I just pulled a tricky one on you and changed the y-axis, this now would be in a binding measurement where you actually measure binding itself. It'll have the same shape and it will we'll, uh, just uh, have effects that have to depend on how you normalize to the maximum between the binding and the activity. These uh, 
what we want to know is the binding affinities and the energetic coupling between them. We can't measure these directly. They have to come, especially if you have multiple sites, from fitting of different models to the experimental data. And that is uh, not an easy thing to do in a unique way. And so this, that's illustrated here. These are, this is from a review paper by Stuart Edelstein, uh, who took data from five different studies on calmodulin binding. They're all plotted here from different labs, different papers. You see that the agreement of the data is really, what, uh, really good, that you can fit it with a typical binding type curve. And they fit it uh, knowing that there are four binding sites in Calmodulin with a, an Adair model, which basically has just a four equilibrium constants as you go through more and more in the states populated. Uh, it worked well, fit all the data from the different people. But the range of the parameters that, that each lab used vary by orders of magnitude from each other. And so what this sort of indicates is that the, the amount of information in the binding curve is insufficient to be able to constrain the parameters in the model, which are supposed to be uh, supposed to reveal the biophysical quantities of binding affinity and interaction. And this is true even uh, in a case, this is a similar fit to simulated data, where uh, there are two curves shown here that both fit the data uh, exceptionally well. One of them has equal binding affinities for the four different sites, and the other one has a, a high degree of cooperativity that's pairwise between the first two binding sites and then for the second two binding sites. They give essentially an identical fit to the data, even though they have completely different mechanistic implications. So again, activation data, binding data, can't constrain reasonable models well enough to learn anything mechanistically important. And so this is an issue that has been dealt with in a lot of different areas, uh, and uh, particularly in machine learning and, and some systems biology. And it's called parameter identifiability. And a parameter is identifiable if it, uh, at, that a single set of parameters uh, can uniquely fit the data. If other sets of parameters can fit the data equally as well, then it's known as non-identifiability, which means you have very little information that you can glean from that. And so we've looked at this by uh, looking at the, the canonical form of these binding equations. This is for a single binding site model like you can see here. Uh, that you can reparameterize that with uh, a single P1, which is a parameter number one, but it has that form. This will give you a single site binding curve, which is stereotyped, that it'll go from 1% to 99% uh, sites occupied in four log units, which gives you the range that the ligand can actually affect the uh, occupancy of the channel or any downstream activity that uh, if you vary the single parameter, it uh, is a location parameter, it moves around the midpoint, but there's no parameter in the single site binding mechanism that would change the slope of this. It, it's completely uh, dictated. And so all, all the curves have the same slope. For two binding sites, this now, uh, there'll be uh, two parameters. If you rearrange uh, those, and so we have an A parameter and a P parameter, and uh, essentially we can now do some algebra to main change this around with constant A by varying P, we move the location around just like we did in the same single binding site curve. And so P is a parameter location. If we hold P constant, vary A, 
then we get a number of different shapes, and so A is a, a, a shape parameter. And these are the two parameters that will fit any, the whole universe of possible two-site binding sites. And so, now you notice that I haven't said anything about affinity or cooperativity here, because this is taking an approach that is essentially analyzing the line shape of these binding curves in a way that you might with spectroscopy or something like that, and just dealing mathematically with, given the model that's necessary to describe the mechanism, what is the range of possible curves that are, that are, uh, that arise from varying the number of important parameters, two of them for a two-site binding mechanism, and then by analyzing their line shapes, what we can do is make some influences about identifiability, and that's, that's what I'm going to talk about next. This just shows that for the, uh, some of the, the different, this is the Adair Klotz model for two sites, like the one I showed with four sites previously. This is a conditional binding model. Uh, this is also true for the MWC model, the KNF model, and other popular ones for binding. And what you can see is that the canon canonical form in the middle there can be substituted into these by uh, just basically recasting the uh, biological properties into the canonical form. And so depending on how the, the particular model constrains the mechanism, they can all go into this particular canonical form so that we can then spit the data by this line shape type of analysis and then go from there to try and determine what the mechanism is. So uh, this gets more complicated the more sites that you add, but they still fit into the same sort of parameter. As we go to four sites, we have a one location parameter and and three different shape parameters, uh, that it, it's true for any number of sites in terms of the number of parameters, although visualizing it gets to be difficult as the dimensionality goes up higher. And so this is the depiction of the universe of two site binding curves, is that uh, if they have a single uh, position parameter, then as we change the shape parameter, uh, this is now over uh, a factor of about 10,000. Uh, you can see how that binding curve shape will change. And that's just uh, showing the same thing, except now as we move the shape parameter around over a very wide range. And you can see what happens is that they, essentially this is going from a, a double bump to a, a single uh, higher slope. And we'll come back to that. So this is for three binding sites. Uh, we have two shape parameters and a fixed uh, position parameter. And this is a depiction. Any point on this infinite plane will describe a possible binding curve. And that you can find what fits best and matches your data. Uh, and then determine from there whether you get unique solutions of parameters and are therefore an identifiable system that you can actually use to make some mechanistic conclusions or it'll be non-identifiable and you can't. And so the way of doing that is involves a, a, a little bit of, of, well, what to you might not be, but to, to us was kind of tricky algebra. And basically you can take the canonical form with whatever number of binding sites that you uh, think there should be. You can then look at the universe of binding curve depictions like I've shown before. If you do a partial fraction uh, expansion of the curves, and then by uh, uh, you can calculate what's known as a, a root locus map. And what this is is actually by solving the partial fraction uh, expansion and what it turns out is that, there, uh, that you end up for two sites uh, with the roots of a quadratic. And when they're real, it's identifiable. When they're complex, it's not. 
and it's, it's for two sites, it's, it's as simple as that. And so now what we can do is we can look at this universe of different binding curves, but there's a certain cutoff that's right around 0 0.5 where if the curves look like this and are adequately fit with these shape parameters, they're unique fits. If they're out here, then they're not. Now, unfortunately, most biological ones look more like this than they do like this, and so this is kind of an early indicator of some, some trouble with analyzing binding curves for real biophysical information. For three sites, it turns out the identifiable region is this here. And uh, if anybody that's interested, this is all, all published from JGT a couple of years ago. Uh, and that anything out here, any shape like this, can be fit with an infinite number of, of uh, parameter sets. For, and I'm going to go up one more dimension because it can be depicted in two dimensions. Uh, this is now if we have uh, three different shape parameters uh, for the four binding sites, then anything that's within this volume is identifiable. Anything outside of it is not. And so now we have a way of saying, okay, here's the shape of the curve. Can we extract reasonable uh, values from that that mean something mechanistically? And we can do it in some kind, so we can, we can make a test about identifiable. But for two sides, that tells us Basically, we can describe all the curves with two parameters, but biophysically, we're really interested in three. We're interested in the, for two sites, the affinity of the first site, the affinity of the second site, and the uh, effect of occupancy on one site on the affinity of the other. By thermodynamics, uh, this has to be a uh, unit direction or a, a, a equilibrium system where going around this way is equal to the probability of going around this way. This gives us uh, now parameters that we can, can fit, but that tell us ambiguity about the important aspects of it. And we call these boomerang plots. This is for a particular shape factor. And that is identifiable for the two parameters that uh, that describe the shape of this curve, uh, the shape and the, uh, and the position factor, uh, but uh, it'll have a midpoint that we can extract parameters from. And, but anything on this curve where we're plot plotting the two affinities, the, the higher affinity and the lower affinity, and uh, the cooperativity, so, and these will go out to infinity, but any set of values that fall on this curve will fit the data exactly mathematically the same. And so we get basically an infinite number of, of parameters, even for this simple two state model, two site model, where we, we can't exa extract uh, anything beyond what's on this curve although the curve does, does tell us a little bit. So it even can't tell positive from negative cooperativity. Uh, cooperativity of one is, is none, so the sites don't interact. In this way, binding at one increases the affinity of the other. In this way, binding at one decreases the affinity of the other. And uh, this particular shape won't let us tell us uh, if there's no cooperativity or there is positive or, or negative cooperativity. So, and that just to show these points are negatively cooperative, that's no cooperativity, these are positively cooperative, and those will give identical fits for the data. So it, it's bad news if you're really trying to learn something mechanistic. Um, now, it does tell us a couple of things tells us the minimum amount of cooperativity. And that can be useful for some shapes, but we know that it can't be below uh, 0.01, although it can go out infinitely in the other direction. It also gives us the 
maximum uh, affinity of the high affinity sites. And uh, if we know something more, say we know that the sites are identical, that they have the same affinity, then there's only one point that fits that, and we can know the cooperativity. And now we've reduced it to a system where we can really measure the, the two equal binding affinities and the cooperativity. If we know that there's no cooperativity uh, by other means, then we get a unique solution on this line here where the uh, cooperativity factor is, is one. Now, this is for a perfect fit for noiseless data. Yeah, I, I wish we could get noiseless data. Uh, if you guys do, congratulations. Uh, but if there's noise, even at 5%, the effect that this has is that it smears out, and we, we call these fuzzy boomerang plots, and so it, it just makes wider ranges of the fit uh, unacceptable for, for real conclusions. Uh, this just shows three how they will change with different A factors. Uh, and they'll move around, and you can see in this particular case, uh, with this, there there must be positive cooperativity because this point is is way uh, to the right of the the value of one. But the position of these depend on the actual shape of the line, and so you get some constraint, but it's not very much. And then again, there's the five percent error. Uh, fuzziness. So the conclusion is, is that you know, determining mechanistic physical models uh, from ligand binding or, or activation models is difficult. It takes uh, forming a model. The model curves have a canonical form that depend on the number of binding sites only, uh, but you can only calculate parameter identifiability by analyzing the shape of these binding curves. I didn't show you the data, but a lot of published binding con uh, constants are not identifiable uh, by this analysis and, and probably don't mean anything in the literature. If they were based on pure binding measurements, if there was separate line of analysis, the measurements that, that corroborated some of it, then that would be uh, important, and, and I think that the bottom line here is that you need to have new kinds of measurements or orthogonal types of data in order to be able to constrain these sorts of uh, ligand activation type of models for most uh, biological circuits. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to, to this part where we're concerned about the, not the calcium binding to calmodulin, except for in a, in a secondary sort of way, but on the calmodulin interactions with the uh, binding peptides. Yeah, so Chris. For I, I think you can put on limits. You can say it would be crazy if cooperativity happened over you know, 10 to the 40th. Uh, but you know, since since the cooperativity is the uh, is the log of the energy difference, uh, it can get into pretty high numbers at reasonable energy. Uh, and so I think that's a reasonable thing to do, but that technically it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. Yeah. And unfortunately, we, we've spent a lot of time on looking at uh, site-specific binding measurements where you can measure binding at one position independent of the other position. And those do a lot for you, but not very a lot, but not much. Uh, they basically say that anything that's in about the first uh, bit of this curve over maybe three log units in cooperativity 
you can actually identify where you couldn't with just a total binding measurement. But anything more than that it is still fairly uh, suspect and not identifiable. So site-specific binding measurements help, but not by as much as you'd want for them to be. Yeah. Yeah, you put, a, you put some sort of reporter at one site, and, uh, and, and essentially what it does is it, may, it lets you measure three different configurations, this probability, this group probability, and this probability. And, uh, and so you have three things you measure instead of just two. Whereas with total binding, you measure this versus all three of those. Does that make sense? Okay, so now when we started this, there, there was a, uh, a fairly predominant structure of Helmodulin complex with the SK binding domain. And this is from Schumacher and Edelman. And it showed basically that there were two Calmodulins here and here wrapped around two uh, binding sites uh, and a parallel helical bundle. And, uh, and what's more, the in lobe had calcium and the C lobe didn't, giving the idea that gating happens because the C lobe is constitutively bound uh, and in a non calcium dependent way. And when the in lobe binds calcium, then that actually makes it bind to the other half. And if this goes across subunits, then activation happens by a chemical uh, bridge between the subunits, and somehow that opens the channel. Uh, so then recently, uh, the McKinnon lab published a cryo-EM structure that agreed with this in some ways, although it, it differs in some significant ways. And what they found is that they're actually one-to-one -one ratio. There's not the two-to-two -two ratio between calmodulin and the binding protein. That the C lobe stays attached, and this is the this is the side view with the cytoplasmic domain down here, and this is now looking from the from the cytoplasmic uh, out through the channel, and that the in lobe, according to their their classes that they described for the, the cryostructures could be in a number of different places uh, along here in the absence of calcium, but in the presence of calcium, it bound uh, to uh, a place here. So it sort of fits the general features of the Schumacher-Edelman model, but doesn't have the dimer-dimer type structure. And in between those two different structures, we had done uh, some determinations of stoichiometry between calmodulin and the, uh, the binding peptide by looking at uh, light scattering measurements. And light scattering is, is nice. If the system is simple enough, it gives you a readout of molecular weight by measuring the, the light scattering. And the way that we did it was something called composition gradient light scattering measurements where Essentially, uh, the machine titrates for you that you can now uh, do an experiment where you ramp up the uh, binding peptide and then ramp it down at the same time you're ramping up the calmodulin uh, concentration. So it, uh, at this end, it's mostly all calmodulin. At this end, it's mostly binding peptide. And since they have different molecular weights, then you can calculate what the different stoichiometries would look like with this mixing titration. And so a one-to-one, -one, well, if there was no interaction, it would look like this. It's just a weighted average between the two molecular weights. But if they associate with each other, then you get particles that have the molecular weight of the sum of the two. And if they're in a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, it'll look like this. A Two peptide to one calmodulin will look like this. A one peptide to two calmodulin will look like this. 
and the 2 to 2 is predicted from the Schumacher-Edelman structure of the Lux class. Like 2 to 2, same as the 1 to 1, but it maxes out at the, uh, uh, the higher mass of the, the two of each. And so in, in doing this, this is now an experiment in EGTA with uh, essentially no calcium around. What we see looks like this, and a quantitative fit to this suggests that this is mostly one-to-one -one with a slight hint of at least some, this, this tendency for a bump over here uh, is that there's some of the uh, two-peptide to one calmodulin bridging stoichiometry, and that the maximum molecular weight here is much, much below what you'd expect from the two-to-two that we basically see no evidence of the dimer-dimer uh, model that was in the crystal structure from Schumacher and Abel, uh, Edelman. If we then add calcium at concentrations that are sufficient to saturate the activation of the channel, uh, we see this shape that uh, is basically a double hump. This is now a change in the amount of the two-to-one component and a grow in of the one to two. This is one peptide, two calmodulin uh, component here that calcium induces. So it changes the stoichiometry. This is in solution. So it, the idea is that the, the, the C lobe will bind to one peptide over here, and the only thing left over is the N lobe to bind to another peptide. So this. Uh, this one to two, or, or two calmodulin one peptide, uh, will be uh, uh, a bridging and, and suggest that the peptide has a site that can be occupied either, either by the N lobe or the C lobe, or it has both sites present, so it can do that. If you then look at other ions, uh, magnesium doesn't activate the channel. It forms the two peptide to one stoichiometry just fine, but not the, uh, the two calmodulin to uh, one uh, peptide stoichiometry at all. If you look at strontium, strontium acts like calcium, barium acts like magnesium, and now we can go and do. Uh, electrophysiological studies and look at this range of ions in activation. And these are uh, currents from RAMP. And basically what you see here is that magnesium doesn't activate at all. Uh, strontium activates uh, just as well as calcium does. Uh, this is just a lower concentration subsaturated calcium. And that barium, even though it doesn't form much of this complex, uh, which correlates with activation for the other cases, actually is some sort of partial agonist uh, that can activate the channel a little bit. So this is unusual because barium is not a favored binding partner with EFM type structure. And so it's not acting like we think it should from these data and for other data on barium. And it's something that we, we basically don't understand and need to look into more. But we get a correlation between the formation of this uh, one cal uh, two calmodulin one peptide for uh, the uh, ions that actually activate the channel. So this fits in with the idea that there's some sort of bridge, but unlike the, uh, the McKinnon mechanism, both of these binding sites are within the same peptide, as in, but in their mechanism, The binding sites are on two different regions of the channel. The, the C lobe tends to be down here, and the N lobe can be a lot of places, but in the presence of calcium, seems to favor binding to another place in the protein. This is actually the intracellular linker between the S4 and the S5. So they would like the idea that the calcium, the, the calmodulin C lobe is bound to the same place that we think it is, that the, uh, that the N lobe is floating around in the absence of calcium, but when it gets calcified, 
then it binds to the 4-5 linker, which is everybody's favorite place for being connected to the gate, and therefore opens the channel. I think that our discrepancy is that I think some of these in low binding sites that aren't actually just flopping around, but are binding to sites that are uh, near where the CELO binds. And we're looking into that some more and, and trying to sort out exactly what the determinants are. So it seems like that, that this bridging idea uh, is, is a reasonable one, but we think it's more complicated and that we can see using these light scattering uh, measurements some, some stoichiometric states that translate into intermediate positions between the uh, fully activated and the bridging structure and the fully non-calcified uh, C-terminal, C-lobe bound only. And so there's, there's more to do with this. Uh, there are caveats all the way around. Uh, you know, we're working just on soluble fragments that are in the cytoplasm. Uh, we're not looking at the, the full channel, but we have higher resolution to detect binding than uh, by seeing the uh, places in the, the cryo-EM structure. And so I, th I think that as, as that there's a lot of agreement and there's disagreement that probably comes from the system being more complex than the, the simple McKinnon type model. And we're following up on this with a lot of more mutations and things like that. So that's kind of the state of that. It's interesting to think about the structure of the calmodulin and all these uh, known structures. There's a non-calcified calmodulin structures in lobe and the C lobe. In CAM kinase 2, which is a target that's being studied a lot, that it basically wraps the lobes around the uh, uh, binding protein that comes from the CAM K2 and forms sort of a, a encircling kind of configuration. In the three known different cal calmodulin to FK structures, the calmodulin has a completely different configuration in each one of them. So this is the uh, uh, Edelman uh, Schumacher structure where the in lobe and the C lobe fold around actually three two to three different helices in the middle. This is a, a splice variant uh, that's been looked at by uh, Zhu Hong Zhang who finds that it still has the same sort of two, two stroke geometry, but in this case, we have an S-shaped calmodulin that bends one way on the in lobe and the other way on the C lobe. And the McKinnon model has a W-shaped calmodulin that's even more hyper extended than, than the, uh, the non-calcified solution version. So there's an inconsistency with this that might be explainable just because crystal packing relationships, things like that, differences in methods, but it seems to not completely fit nicely in a unified mechanism. So I, I think we have more to find out about this, and uh, that I, I think that some of uh, our light scattering studies that we're going on with is going to tell us a little bit more about it. But the limit of how much we can find out will depend uh, ultimately on the fact that it's just using a soluble uh, form instead of the whole channel. But this is all, all those different calmodulins I showed you from the, you know, I don't know how, 30 different structures. You know, none of them look like this. This would be completely unprecedented. But then again, calmodulin is very flexible and may, maybe this is the structure that, that really matters for activation. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this, this is, uh, these are two are both SK2. This is SK4, which doesn't actually exist in the known literature, but uh, it's known as IK to everybody except for Rod, who calls it SK4. Uh, but it, 
the IK channel works by an indistinguishable mechanism based on functional measurement. Uh, this is a splice variance that that, uh, that just adds, uh, I think, three residues and makes these CNCs longer. And that's the only uh, real difference. And of course, this is in a, a full channel. But it's really interesting if you take the, the Schumacher structure that I showed you before, which essentially was a dimer of dimers that looks sort of like this. If you look at the McKinnon structure, it looks sort of like this. So the, the two halves of it are very similar uh, to each other. It just doesn't form the dimer of dimers. And so I, I think that, that they essentially got it close to right, at least in agreement, but they, uh, that the dimerization was probably a crystal packing artifact would be the, the simplest explanation for that. But, but it's interesting that the structure within the dimer actually looks quite a bit like uh, the, uh, the structure in the cryo with these differences. Yeah, Larry? Uh, tau modulum binding sites have very indeterminate uh, properties. Uh, they're generally called I2 domains because there's a, uh, an I and a Q. Uh, yeah, but they're, they may be 20 residues long and they may or may not have charged sites five positions away from the IQ. And, and it's really just not consistent, consensus in any way. But then, come on, so you have 148 very highly conserved residues. Only maybe 50 of those are involved in calcium binding directly at the four different sites. The rest of it's all conserved too, and it has to do with the, the interactions with all of the different targets. And, and so it's a funny problem to look at sequence differences when the reasons for sequence differences and conservation when there's no conservation, when it's completely conserved. You don't have a lot of bandwidth there by altering things. But uh, we're going to, the thing I haven't shown you that we're excited about now is that we've been collaborating with the lab to do some. Uh, fast two-dimensional IR spectroscopy that will uh, let us look at interactions between binding partners and also let us look at how the structure of the binding site changes when calcium or some other ion is, uh, is bound. And uh, I, I think we're going to be able to learn a lot about that too in a kind of different way than this. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think really that it takes a lot of techniques to, if you just look at one as if maybe binding curve, there's not a lot you can find out. And, and we need to find out how to integrate all these different type of measurements to really make a difference. So, I told you that uh, the binding measurements are tricky that it's hard to know anything just based on them. You need to know other things in order to interpret them. Uh, development of new methodologies is, uh, uh, will help a lot. That the interactions between the uh, Calmodulin and the channel have some very nice uh, areas of consensus from different properties and some real differences and we need to sort out what about the differences matter. Uh, each technique has given us kind of a different window into the process and it's ongoing work. And uh, there have been a lot of people in the lab that have really contributed a lot to this and their names are, are here and their picture is here. Uh, they uh, did a lot. They, uh, Jenny Bernier is now working for a uh, bioengineering company in Austin. Uh, she did uh, some work that I didn't tell you much about, about site-specific binding measurements. Tom Middendorf is, uh, has done all of the theoretical analysis of parameter identifiability. Margo Miller helped out with uh, some of the measurements. She's a technician in the lab. She's now a medical student at the University of Utah. Uh, 
Fred Hallin is the chief protein biochemist in the lab and uh, did the light scattering uh, experiments. Ben Liebeskin did the, which I always showed you a bit of, the evolutionary conservation analysis, which uh, is a bigger story than what I showed. He's now working for the State Department. Uh, Amelia Hall uh, helped out with that work. She was a technician in the lab, then a graduate student at UT in microbiology, and is uh, now a postdoc uh, working on uh, genomics of cardiac uh, uh, diseases. Uh, Susie Bennett was a, an amazing undergraduate who really did a lot to help out, and she's now a graduate student at Stanford. Ashley Philpo uh, is a technician who did a lot of the uh, activation uh, measurements of the electrophysiology, and Sean and Carlos are our collaborators in the uh, IR spectroscopy, and they know infinitely more about it than I do, and it's been really fun learning from them because I'm, I'm naively greatly enthusiastic about the techniques, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we really get something like that. So thanks for listening. Thanks for not leaving early to go to Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm going home and going to Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, but also, just thanks for a great day. I really enjoyed hearing about all of your work. And it, it's been way too long. I'll try to come back for another dose uh, before as long as it's been since the last time I was here. So thanks for everything. Yeah, it was the same piece as ours, pretty much, except for theirs had a, uh, a histidine tag on it that they uh, didn't acknowledge that we, we thought was the, the reason that our results didn't affect, but it, it wasn't that. It was, uh, um, It binds really tightly. And, uh, and so, for instance, if, if you, there, there's an experiment I didn't show here. It was one that Wei-Yan Lee did when he was in the lab. And if you express SK in an oocyte with native calmodulin and pull the patch off the cell, you'll get consistent current for as long as the patch lasts, always. <laughs> It never, never comes out. If you co-express uh, with a mutant calmodulin gene at just the right levels that it will complete off the wild type, uh, you can pull the patch off and that will fall off again. And then when you then perfuse on wild type calmodulin, it will stick hard and will never come off. And so the, the affinity... And we've estimated a little bit from the light scattering that the upper limits of the KD are probably on the order of 100 picos or less. So it, it's really, really tight. Uh, by looking at the current uh, and, and stuff, what, when you pull the patch off, uh, you either see some initial current that dictated down to zero or you see zero, and then you put calmodulin on and it all takes a long time. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And, and I don't think we really know. We have uh, some really tantalizing preliminary single channel data that suggests that the channel can open with uh, as few as one calmodulin per tetramer, up to four, but that the gating gets more and more highly probable to be open depending on the number that are on it. Uh, I think that that's probably the only way we can can really uh, get a good handle on that, and it's one beautiful experiment that hadn't been repeated. So uh, if anybody wants to come do it.
I've had a hard time talking to you. There, there complete, there's complete agreement that the in lobe and the C lobe are different. And one of the reasons, one of the most compelling simple results about that is that the, uh, the in lobe and the C lobe have opposite preferences for calcium over lanthanide. And so one lobe will bind terbium better, the other lobe will bind calcium better. Uh, now, whether the sites, the neighboring sites are different. Uh, our, we have data that suggests there are, but the conservation is so tight to make their sequences different that there has to be something that I, I think is mechanistically different between site one and two and site three. I'm sorry. What? Uh, well, it depends on which one of the, uh, the structures you, you believe. And uh, I think there would be agreement on the CELO binding site. It's pretty close to the same place, according to everybody. The in lobe site, uh, and we see an in lobe site on our peptide, and, uh, and we don't have the, the 4 or 5 linker around. Unfortunately, it's, it's a big bend, and so it's not going to work in solution. And uh, we've tried it just to hope that maybe all the problems would magically disappear. And, uh, and we get a little bit of binding. But yeah, you can explain it any way you want. So it was, it was actually kind of a dumb experiment to do, but we couldn't help it. Uh, so I don't think we know all about where the end lobe is binding. If I remember it right for SK, it involved more uh, free parameters, and so it probably would fit, and it would imply different mechanisms, but there's no valid way to test whether it's more appropriate or not. It was mostly uh, flow dialysis with radio tracers from, from the, those previous uh, studies. And some, of it, some of it was also, uh, there's a tyrosine uh, fluorescence change that occurs upon calcium binding. It's not clear, it, it's not a residue that's probably bound in binding. It probably reports the, the conformational adjust, uh, adjustment upon binding. But uh, and oh, barium? I don't know. No, I, I, I told you all I know, and unfortunately, we haven't done a a, a, a good titration of barium. And uh, you know, barium for on calcium channels, how module and barium doesn't do anything. I, I think that it's questionable whether it binds or not. But it certainly doesn't cause calcium dependent inactivation. And I don't I don't think so. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah, no, no, the barium deserves the barium deserves a whole lot more uh, study and we just haven't done it yet. Uh, we were surprised when we found this discrepancy. And the fact 
is real interesting that it only, it's not a good agonist, it, but, it's, but it's a significant one. And so we, we just haven't done it yet. Yeah, Rufus. Bridge in between. Oh, with calcium channel. Maybe yeah, through through something else. Uh, so there's work that actually first started at Chris's lab that uh, that certain calcium activated channels are activated by certain calcium channels, and they seem to be close enough to each other that they must be linked somehow because they can't be uh, explained by, you know, random distribution. And then it's been done with different calcium channels and different calcium activated K channels and different cells by several people now. And Edelman has shown that there, there's a kinase that is in complex with SK, too. Uh, so there, there's a lot in that complex, and it's probably variable depending on the cells and and that, that's another area that's really ripe for more study, or any type of channel, actually. Yeah, John. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so those were equilibrium binding. They, they did, weren't kinetics. Uh, Kinetics tell you more, but they introduce new free parameters. And so it's kind of a trade-off. It doesn't help as much as, as you might uh, think that it would quantitatively. Uh, I think that it would be, so I think we could predict some of the binding energies, and, and this goes back a little bit to uh, limiting the physiological ranges. Some of these equilibrium parameters for affinities would probably hold on to the calcium longer than it's known from kinetic dissociation. So in that way, that helps constrain the range of parameters that you look at by, by knowing off rates, for instance. Probably depends on who you ask. Uh, I, I think it could tell you a lot about selectivity and the binding sites and, and things like that. Uh, I think that the nice thing about the IR spectroscopy is it's, it's working. It's showing changes in the picoseconds and sub-angstrom time scales. And so there'll be a really nice thing to compare with molecular dynamics. It's completely within the range that's acceptable. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to do some of that. Uh, it's not like looking at channel openings. It's you know you can do the, the longest dynamics you want and ever and not see an opening. Yes, sir. It, 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 I, I think that it's turning out that they're mostly constitutively bound. Uh, they may be bind to different sites under different states. Some of the calcium channel CDI uh, models predict that. Um, but you know, SK channels work with a midpoint of maybe about 800 nanomolar or something like that, depending on exactly what the conditions are. Uh, so they're about 10 times more sensitive than BK. And, you know, BK has a uh, less specific binding geometry. It, it, it's got a load of, uh, of you know, carboxyls all around together. And, and the, the EF hand binding site is conserved across so many different types of proteins beyond cell modulin that it's a, a highly selective group. And then, you know, you found that cadmium and all sorts of other things you know, do very well in activating BK, and, and they won't activate SK at all because of the specificity of the EF hand. That's why barium, again, is such a focus. 
Yeah, I know. Right before Blossom. <laughs> okay, thank you guys.